Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing cardiac arrhythmias. Okay, so in this next video we're going to look at another very serious ventricular arrhythmia, uh, namely torsade de point. Now, the name is French and it means twisting, that's torsade, uh, and then of is de, and then points is points. So twisting of the points. Um, and when we look at the ECG that arises during an episode of torsade de poids, you'll understand why it's called that, because the ECG continuously twists above and below uh, the isoelectric line. So you'll go from having lots of deviations that are above the isoelectric line, and then it'll suddenly twist round, and you'll have lots of deviations below the isoelectric line, and then it'll twist back up again, so that you've got deviations up from the isoelectric line. So that's the reason it's known as torsade de point, twisting of the points. Okay, so what I want to do firstly is explain what is actually going to cause uh, this uh, arrhythmia. Okay, so this arrhythmia is caused by something known as long QT syndrome. And long QT syndrome involves having a too long cardiac action potential. Now, there are lots of different reasons that you can end up with a too long cardiac action potential. For instance, drugs, electrolyte abnormalities, and there are genetic reasons as well. And I want to go through all of these different examples. Okay, so long QT syndrome often abbreviated down to LQTS, and then what we'll do is we'll talk about why having a long cardiac action potential actually results in uh, a, a very dangerous arrhythmia, this torsade de poids. Okay, so your long QT syndrome. So long QT syndrome, as I've said, it is, well, it means that the action potential in your cardiomyocytes is too long. Uh, so if I draw another picture of the action potential in a normal cardiomyocyte, and let's think about a ventricular cardiomyocyte. So let's have here, let's say this is a ventricular cardiomyocyte, and what we're going to do is be following the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane as a point on the membrane of uh, this cardiomyocyte. So we're going to be watching the cardiac action poten potential uh, across the membrane here. Okay, so here's our normal graph. We'll have the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane on the y-axis here, and we'll have time along the x-axis, and usually the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane starts off at about negative 80 millivolts, then you'll have depolarization up to threshold potential, I'll go through this very quickly because we've done this previously, then after you get up to threshold potential, which is usually around negative 40 millivolts, you'll then have the opening of the voltage-gated sodium channels, which will depolarize you up to probably around plus 20 millivolts here. Uh, then the voltage-gated sodium channels will inactivate, and just about the time when the voltage-gated sodium channels are inactivating, you'll then get the early voltage-gated potassium channels opening, so you'll get this early repolarization due to some voltage-gated potassium channels that open very quickly. Uh, and then what will happen is you'll get L-type voltage-gated calcium channels opening, and this will balance the movement of potassium out um, through the voltage-gated potassium channels. So you'll have calcium moving in through the opening L-type voltage-gated calcium channels, and potassium moving out through the voltage-gated potassium channels, and then you'll go into the plateau phase. Then the L-type voltage-gated calcium channels will start to inactivate. More and more voltage-gated potassium channels will start to open, so you'll then go into the repolarization phase here. Okay, so here is my picture of the normal cardiac action potential uh, in a ventricular cardiomyocyte, for instance. Okay, in long QT syndrome, what's going to happen is the cardiac action potential is going to go on for much longer. So the plateau phase will be extended and the repolarization phase will take much longer, like so. So maybe your cardiac action potential will look like this, uh, rather than like this. Okay, now why is this called Long QT Syndrome? Well, the reason it's called Long QT Syndrome is that you can actually see whether someone has this, i.e. whether all of their ventricular cardiomyocytes are taking um, uh, well, have long action potentials looking at the ECG. So let me just draw out an ECG here. So the normal ECG looks like this. You've got the P wave, then you've got the interval between the P wave and the QRS complex. You've then got the beginning of the QRS complex representing ventricular depolarization. You've then got the ST segment 
and then finally the T wave, which is ventricular repolarization. Now, if the cardiac action potential in all of the ventricular cardiomyocytes is extended, then repolarization will take much longer to occur. So this segment of the cardiac action potential, the ST segment here, which remember is the phase where all of the ventricular cardiomyocytes are in the plateau phase of the action potential, and there's no wave of repolarization started yet, this is going to be hugely extended. Okay, and this will mean that the QT interval, which is the interval from the beginning of the QRS complex here, to the end of the T wave here, so this interval here is known as the QT interval. This interval will be hugely extended, so that's why it's called long QT syndrome, because the QT interval on the electrocardiogram will be longer. You could have called it long ST syndrome if you liked, uh, because really it's the ST segment that's going to be lengthened, but instead we uh, refer to this QT interval and call it long QT syndrome. So in people with long QT syndrome, their ECG uh, will have a much longer ST segment here. That's if they haven't gone into torsade poix yet. Okay, so if you, you haven't got this very, very dangerous arrhythmia arising yet, but you have got long QT syndrome, you can see that on the ECG. Okay, right. Um, so that's what occurs in long QT syndrome. The cardiac action potential in the ventricular cardiomyocytes and also in the atrial cardiomyocytes is going to take far too long. Okay, now let's talk about potential reasons that this can occur. So there are lots of drugs that can do this to you. Uh, in particular, we've actually mentioned one as an anti-dysrhythmic drug or an anti-arrhythmic drug. Amiodarone, the class 3 anti-arrhythmic drug, was actually used um, because it lengthened the cardiac action potential. It blocked voltage-gated potassium channels and therefore lengthened the period uh, for repolarization. So amiodarone is actually capable of causing long QT syndrome and paradoxically can actually lead to torsade de poids. So amiodarone, this anti-arrhythmic drug, is actually also very dangerous and can lead to a much more dangerous arrhythmia potentially than the one you were using it to treat. So amiodarone is a potentially dangerous drug, so be aware of that. Other drugs that can do this uh, that you should be aware of are the macrolide antibiotics, so erythromycin, clarithromycin, azithromycin. Remember, they all work by uh, plugging the bacterial ribosome and preventing the emerging polypeptide from being able to actually leave the ribosome and hence prevent uh, bacterial translation, prevent protein synthesis. They can all lengthen the cardiac action potential. In addition, the tricyclic antidepressants, which are old drugs used to uh, treat depression, they were used um, before the rise of Prozac uh, and the other SSRIs. Um, so they work by um, blocking the reuptake of serotonin and also noradrenaline, raising those levels of those very important neurotransmitters in the brain, and that somehow helps with depression. Uh, but those drugs, the tricyclic antidepressants, often abbreviated to the TCAs, are often uh, ca are capable of lengthening the cardiac action potential and can lead potentially to torsade de poids. Okay, so drugs are capable of lengthening the cardiac action potential, usually by affecting voltage-gated potassium channels, blocking voltage-gated potassium channels, uh, and therefore uh, lengthening the time that it will take for the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane to be repolarized. Okay, other things that then can cause long QT syndrome that are genetic long QT syndromes. If you have mutations in voltage-gated potassium channels that lead to their function being reduced, then that can actually mean that the cardiomyocytes are going to take longer to repolarize the electrical potential difference across their cell membrane. So there are genetic causes of long QT syndrome. In addition, there are electrolyte disturbances that can result in long QT syndrome. Now, the obvious one is if you've got uh, potassium disturbances, okay, so hypokalemia can lead to uh, long QT syndrome. So hypokalemia means too low uh, potassium level in the blood uh, stream, and of course if you've got too low potassium level in the bloodstream, you're going to have too low potassium in the extracellular fluid because they're in equilibrium with one another.
Okay, so hypokalemia can actually lead to long QT syndrome. In addition, hypomagnesemia. Hypomag ooh, can I spell this? Magnesemia, which means too low magnesium levels within the blood, uh, which will therefore also lead to too low magnesium levels in the extracellular fluid. That can also lead to long QT syndrome. So these disturbances in your electrolyte levels, hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia, they can also lead to long QT syndrome. Okay, so here are potential causes of this lengthening of the cardiac action potential. Now, this doesn't seem to be too harmful. Okay, yes, it's going to mean that uh, all over the heart, your cardiomyocytes take a little bit longer to repolarize. You can see it on the ECG, but that's not too big a problem. The heart's still going to uh, beat and pump blood in the correct way. However, what can happen is you can get episodes of a very, very dangerous arrhythmia known as torsade poids if you've got long QT syndrome. So too long cardiac action potentials are at risk of causing a very, very dangerous arrhythmia. So let me just get another piece of paper and then I'll try and explain what's going to happen in uh, long QT syndrome, torsade poids. Okay, right. Uh, so, for reasons that aren't fully understood, having a long action potential is actually capable of causing something known as triggered activity. So let me bring back up this picture and then I'll talk about triggered activity before I go on to the next piece of paper. So triggered activity, it's a new arrhythmogenic mechanism. We've looked at lots of mechanisms capable of causing arrhythmias throughout this video. We've seen ectopic foci, we've seen uh, re-entrant loops, things like that. We're now seeing a third new one, the concept of triggered activity. And triggered activity is not well understood at all, but this is what happens. I'm going to give you a description, although I can't really explain to you the mechanism behind this, but somehow this is what is observed to happen. If you have a very long cardiac action potential occurring within your cardiomyocytes, then you are at risk of this phenomenon called triggered activity, and the phenomenon of triggered activity is that in the repolarization portion of the action potential, suddenly you can get little depolarizations like so, okay? For some reason, for reasons that aren't understood, if you've got very long action potentials, then in the repolarization portion, suddenly it can stop repolarizing, and suddenly it can start depolarizing again. And as I say, the mechanisms underlying this are not well understood. Okay, but this is what is observed. Cardiomyocytes that have a very long cardiac action potential, they are at risk of undergoing this triggered activity where during the repolarization phase, suddenly they stop repolarizing and start depolarizing instead. As I say, we don't know the mechanism yet. Now, this depolarization here, this here has a special name. This is known as an after depolarization. So this is a, oh, can I fit it in here? After, and it's all one great big word, uh, but I'm not gonna write it as all one great big word, so there should be a little dash there. After depolarization. So this depolarization during the repolarization phase it's known as a triggered activity, or it's called an after depolarization. So either of those words, uh, they mean the same sort of thing. Okay, and as I say, and I continuously keep saying, we don't really understand the mechanism for this, but something about having a long cardiac action potential puts the cardiomyocytes at risk of having these after depolarizations. Now, if this after depolarization occurs once the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane has gone back to being below threshold potential, below negative 40 millivolts, then what's the potential that's going to happen here? Well, if we're back below negative 40 millivolts, all of the voltage gated sodium channels and the voltage gated calcium channels, they will have gone back into the resting state. So now the potential is that when we re-depolarize the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane and take it back up to threshold potential, that actually the voltage-gated sodium channel is going to be activated again, and you're going to end up with a whole new action potential. So the voltage-gated sodium channels will open, you'll get another upstroke of the action potential, and then the whole thing will repeat itself again. So this triggered activity is capable of causing the cardiac action potential to just happen again. It's capable of causing, effectively, generating, uh, well, 
it's effectively capable of mate turning this cardiomyocyte into an ectopic focus, capable of generating another action potential straight after the one that it's just fired. Okay, so how can this now lead to uh, an arrhythmia then? Well, let's draw a picture of the heart and think about what's going to happen now. So I'll draw my usual picture of the heart, so this usual cross section, like so. So we've then got uh, the left atrium up here, the right atrium here, the right ventricle down here, and the left ventricle down here. Now, let's say we have long QT syndrome then, okay? So our cardiac action potential is long in all of the atrial cardiomyocytes and in the ventricular cardiomyocytes. Now, initially, let's say we weren't arrhythmic, however, so the sinoatrial node was still controlling all of the electrical activity in the heart, the electrical signals were propagating normally, but all of the cardiac action potentials are extended. Now what you are at risk of is episodes of an arrhythmia occurring. Okay, so what can happen is suddenly, and the triggers aren't really that well understood, you can go into an episode of torsade de point. And in this episode of torsade de point, what will happen is, as this electrical signal propagates through the heart, somewhere in the heart, one cardiomyocyte will just happen to get one of these after depolarizations because of the too long uh, action potential, and then it will start firing off electrical signals. So it will fire off an electrical signal. So let's say one cardiomyocyte over here in the wall of the ventricles. It's more likely to arise in the wall of the ventricles because the ventricles have a lot more cardiomyocytes in them than the atria. Okay, so let's say this uh, cardiomyocyte down here, it underwent an after depolarization and therefore it sends off an electrical signal all over the ventricles which will then propagate up to the atria. Okay, uh, that will give another electrical signal propagating across the uh, entire heart. Then let's say somewhere else now another cardiomyocyte is also going to undergo trigger activity. So that one was responsible for that electrical signal. Now what can happen is uh, this one over here received the electrical signal from that one. Its action potential again is too long and it can undergo trigger activity on the next action potential. So what can happen is you can generate these electrical signals at far too high rates and it's continuously moving. This is the important concept. The cardiomyocyte, which is actually generating the next electrical signal, is going to continuously move. So here it was the green one initially that had an after depolarization on the first action potential and it generated the second electrical signal. But now for the third electrical signal it's going to be triggered activity over in this cardiomyocyte here that's going to cause it. So the source of the electrical signal is just going to move around all over the heart. Okay, and this is going to give rise to the incredibly strange ECG for this arrhythmia. So let's now actually uh, talk about what the ECG is going to look like in the case of a torsade de poids uh, arrhythmia. So it's going to continuously move around where the actual electrical signal is originating. So of course if the electrical signal originates up in the high portion of the ventricles or even in the portion of the atria up here, then we're going to get anterograde conduction and therefore we're going to get an upward deflection of the ECG, whereas if it arises down at the bottom here, we're going to get a downward deflection. So what you generally see on a torsade de poids ECG is it ends up looking like this. You've got an upward deflection, which is uh, the ventricles depolarizing because maybe uh, a cardiomyocyte up near the top here has activated the electrical signal then very quickly you'll have another one maybe it's another cardiomyocyte right up at the top of the ventricles that has triggered this one and then it will suddenly flip round like so so here's the isoelectric line I'll just put in the isoelectric line here so it's suddenly flipped round because um, now the cardiomyocyte that underwent the after depolarization and has sent off the electrical activity is down near the bottom and we're getting retrograde conduction up the ventricles and maybe we'll have another one uh, that was sent off from the bottom of the ventricles and they might change size depending on where 
how far down they are. So if it's sort of in this position, it will obviously spread both downwards and upwards, and the downwards uh, cardiac vector will cancel off the upwards portion a little bit. So we might get a small downward deflection there, and then it might twist back up to the top here. Okay, and you won't really see um, the P waves, the atrial depolarization here, because they're just covered up by these large deflections for ventricular depolarization. So this is what the ECG uh, graph can end up looking like then uh, for someone with a torsade point arrhythmia. And this is why it's called torsade point because clearly the uh, peaks, the QRS complexes, uh, for want of a better word, because they don't really look like QRS complexes anymore, are twisting around the isoelectric line. Sometimes they're deflections upwards, and then they go to being deflections downwards. Okay, so that's the what, oh, well, it's a picture of what the ECG might look like if you're suffering from torsade de point. And as I say, it's caused uh, by having a too long cardiac action potential, which puts the cardiomyocyte at risk of these after depolarizations or these triggered activities. And the source of the electrical signal, therefore, will continuously move around the heart, which is why uh, the ECG is this twisting mess. Okay, right. Now, episodes of torsade point generally end spontaneously. So just as they came about spontaneously, they will generally end spontaneously. So it won't go on forever. It will come to an end generally by itself. But of course, this is extremely dangerous because it can result in huge um, rates of ventricular contraction. I mean, it can go up to usually around 250 beats per minute, which is potentially very dangerous and could lead to cardiac arrest. So torsade de point, like ventricular fibrillation, can hugely compromise cardiac output. And if it compromises it enough, uh, then we would call it a cardiac arrest. Now, what's the treatment then for torsade de point? Well, of course, you want to first identify what has caused this. So if it's electrolyte disturbances, hypokalemia, uh, hypomagnesemia, of course you will treat those electrolyte disturbances. If it's some drug causing it, then you will take the person off the drug. If it's a genetic cause, then there is the option to have an implanted defibrillator, so that when the person does go into an episode of torsade de point, the defibrillator, the implanted defibrillator, will shock the heart, uh, reset everything, and hopefully then you'll go back into uh, normal sinus rhythm. Okay, so that's the treatment for genetic uh, long QT syndrome, uh, caused generally by mutations in voltage-gated potassium channels that impair the repolarization phase of the action potential. Okay, so uh, that concludes our discussion of the ventricular arrhythmias. We'll have a break here, and then in the final, uh, well, the final video on the actual arrhythmias, uh, we will talk about AV block and um, bundle branch block. So I've left all of this till last, even though uh, if we were strictly going by our splitting of things into superventricular and ventricular arrhythmias, it should have they should have all been at different points. I've left all of the blocks to the last point because I think they, they're best all discussed together.